We are Troy and Penny Maxwell, the senior pastors of Freedom House Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we want to welcome you to our YouTube channel. That's right. You can catch all of our messages, all of our services. There's incredible worship, and I know God's going to touch it in a powerful way. Absolutely. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube right. channel. Hello, Freedom House, Central Campus. How y'all doing today? Everybody doing well? Man, I tell you, worship about messed me up today. I just gotta be honest. That second song, that's a new one. They snuck that in there on me. I, was, I wasn't expecting that, and I was over there just like, I might go hoarse. I was singing, man. I was like, that one got me. That was a good song. Don't we have a great worship team? They incredible. So, so good. Well, my name is Olin Carter. I serve here on our teaching team. We're so happy that all of you are here with us um, today. If you're new to the house, I see some new faces. Um, we're a unique church. Everything about us, I think, is pretty special, pretty unique. And one of the, the, the unique factors of Freedom House is that although we have multiple campuses um, across the city, we have a live pastor bringing God's word at each one of our campuses, which I think is incredible. We, we took some of our staff to a conference this past week, and a man named Tony Cook, he's a leadership expert pastor, um, he said this, which I thought was incredible. He said, God always starts with a leader, but always finishes with a team. And I love that. I love being a part of a team, don't you? And that's so great. So why don't we give some honor to our senior pastors? you give them a hand clap? Um, because they build this on a team, and I just love that. I love our team. So incredible. And uh, before we jump into God's Word today, a couple quick things. One, I want to greet those that are joining us online. You might not know, but this room is a lot bigger than this room. We have tons of people joining us right now online. We have people from New Jersey, Illinois, Georgia, North Carolina, Minnesota, New York, Puerto Rico, and the United Kingdom. You guys give it up for them. Welcome. We're glad you're with us today. That's awesome. And also, I want to highlight somebody important. Um, this past week, I sent an email out. I hope you got that email, encouraging us as a church to make our voices heard in the political realm. We have a sacred duty in our country to care about the issues and to vote and to make our voices heard. And um, we have someone with us today. Tyler, if you would stand up. This is Tyler Lee. Um, Y'all give Tyler a hand. Tyler is running for Congress. And Tyler attends our church. He goes to our South End campus. Um, he's going to hang out with us today. He's going to be in the lobby. You can meet Tyler. You can talk to him about the issues. The thing I love about Tyler, getting to know him since he's been running, um, I was there the day he announced, and um, so, so exciting. And the thing I love about Tyler, he didn't come to church to get us to vote for him. He was a part of our church his life was changed. He was serving. He serves at South End. He's faithful to the house. And because of what God did in him, he said, hey, I feel called to make a difference. And so he's running for office. Incredible, man. I'm so proud of you. Make sure after service today, you go talk to Tyler, meet him, shake his hand, ask him questions. Make sure you know all about what's going on. It's going to be great, man. Thanks for being with us today. So we're in a great series right now on identity. Identity. And you know, man, I think identity has become kind of a sensitive topic in the world we're in today. Anybody agree with me on that? Does it feel like things have gotten a little touchy? Maybe? Maybe a little touchy? People a little sensitive, right? I mean, we, we, we can be sensitive sometimes. It feels like it's just on like an extra level right now, right? A couple of weeks ago, um, I had to speak at our, our staff meeting here and um, the night before, I did something kind of foolish. Ever been going too fast before and you just do something stupid, yeah. right? Um, and, and I will admit, I'm guilty. Sometimes I make fun of uh, safety precautions, like, ooh, you got your goggles. Like, you know, like, I'm one of those guys. I'm just like, jump in there, do it. You know, well, I paid the piper. I was going a little too quick, moving too fast. My wife, the night before, wanted me to clean the grill. She wanted to use the grill. And so I just jumped in there, had the wire brush, and I'm just like face right over the grill, just going at it. And something just, bow, 
pow, right in my eyeball. Something flew in my eye. Ever had that happen before? It's the worst, right? I mean, just attacks my eye. I mean, something just projectile hits my eyeball, and I'm thinking, no big deal. Had this before. I'll splash some water, you know, wash it out. So I go in, I do that, it's a little irritated. That night I go to bed, I'm thinking, ah, you know, the tears, everything overnight, it'll, it'll come out, you know, whatever it is. Get up the next morning in my eyeball, big red, it's irritated, tears just keep coming down. I mean, it's like I'm crying out of this one eye. I show up and I tell our staff, I'm like, listen, to start off, I'm not angry at anybody because I got this big red eyeball, you know, I got the Popeye eye just like, you know. And I'm like, look, I'm not mad at anybody and I'm not crying. Something is in my eye. My eye is messed up. And so I'm sitting there talking, tears just coming down my eye. So afterwards, I run to the eye doctor. He peels my eyelid up and sure enough, something was in my eye. There was this little black, whatever it was, and it was scratching. He said it was making abrasions on the top of my eye. Now, fortunately, it wasn't low enough, it didn't affect my vision or anything. He's like, no big deal, it'll heal, it'll be fine. You know, he gave me some drops. But man, my eye was so irritated. I mean, it hurt for like a week. Man, I think that's sometimes how identity has become for us in this country. I think sometimes identity has become this sensitive topic that when we talk about identity, even if we talk about something that can be conflated with identity, people get real sensitive. It's like, whoa, don't go there, man. Don't bring up my sexuality. Don't bring up my race. Don't bring up whatever it may be. And people get really sensitive. And I want to do this PSA, this public service announcement for you today. I'm going to talk about some things today that are probably going to rub you a little bit. I might step on some toes today. I might irritate you a little bit, okay? But I want to ask something of you. Just one thing. Fair enough? Okay, I'm gonna ask one thing. Listen until the end and then I invite you to judge what I'm saying. Judge what I'm saying by God's word. Judge what I'm saying by the spirit of God that's in you. Is it loving? Is it coming from the right heart? But wait until the end because I might say some stuff in the middle. Might, <laughs> might push your buttons just a little bit, okay? Okay. Because we're going to talk on, we're going to talk about some sensitive things today. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to Ephesians chapter two. We're going to start reading in verse one. Ephesians two ten is kind of our keystone verse for this whole series we're in about identity. You're going to see why in just a moment if you haven't been here. An incredible verse. But we're going to read verses one through ten. Um, if you're a Christian, turn there in your Bibles. If you're not, cheat off a Christian next to you. Nobody carries Bibles anymore. Raise your, if, if you have a physical Bible, raise it up. Yeah, nobody carries Bibles anymore. I'm telling you. Let me tell you. It's fine. Bibles on your phone is just as good. I, I get it. But people who carry the big Bible, they're a little more spiritual than the rest of us, I think. They get a little extra credit. You know, the size of your Bible, the weight, the heft. You know, you get, you know, in heaven, you know, it's like in the Olympics when they land and they get, well, it's like a 7.9, you know, you get a little more for the size of your Bible. So chapter two, verse one, it says, and although you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you formerly lived according to this world's present past. So who's he talking to here? He's talking to believers. Okay. He's talking to Christians. He says, and although you were dead, so he's talking about your past, your past identity, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air. We know he's talking about there. The ruler of the spirit. Now listen, it, maybe circle this, underline this. Um, the ruler of the spirit, that is now energizing, he says, energizing the sons of disobedience. Interesting. Interesting. He's energizing, he's fueling, he's empowering the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly, formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, amen, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? We all start out in a pretty grim place according to the word of God, but I love verse 4. One of my favorite things in all of scripture, but God, right? We're all in a pit. We're all, we start out in life identified in some way by our sin, but 
God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Can I get an amen? Amen. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? To demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the most famous quoted passages of scripture ever, one of my favorites, starting in verse eight, for by grace you are saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from work so that no one can boast. Verse 10, this is our keystone verse. For we are his workmanship. Another translation of that says masterpiece. We are his workmanship. Having been created in Christ Jesus for good works. That God prepared beforehand so we may do them. What an incredible passage of scripture, isn't it? Never gets old reading this. And it's so good because it identifies and it clarifies some important things about our identity. This passage makes it clear that we all start out in some way being identified by our sin. And I don't know about you, I know I've lived significant periods of my life, weeks, months, even years, identified or finding my identity in my sin. Ever woken up in shame because of something you've done? A shame you can't shake, a shame that seems to just follow you around like a black cloud. And no matter how good things go at work, no matter what promise there might be in a new exciting relationship, you can't get out of your head that thing you did, that sin you committed, that that thing that kind of follows us around. And God sent Christ to free us from that shame to make sure that we don't have to live based in this old identity of our sin because through God, through Christ, we're offered a new identity. In order to understand identity fully, I think for us to really grasp what identity means spiritually, we need to look at two things. We need to look at the worldly viewpoint because we live in the world, right? As spiritual as y'all are. And I know, listen, I talk to y'all. Some of y'all are pretty spiritual. I mean, y'all float around here. I mean, it's like some of our usher, I mean, it's like their feet don't even touch the ground. I mean, they're just floating, man, the Holy Ghost. I mean, we're pretty spiritual, but hey, no matter how spiritual you are, we still live in the world. Monday morning, we got to put our pants on. We got to go to work. We got to do the stuff. We got to pay the bills, right? There are going to be people that are going to agitate us. Our identity is going to be challenged. And so we live in a real world. So what's the world telling us trying to push on us about our identity? How is our identity being challenged in the world? So what's the world's viewpoint on identity? And what is the kingdom? Everybody say kingdom. Kingdom. What is the kingdom viewpoint? Now I'm gonna say kingdom a bunch today. When I'm talking about the kingdom, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. And in the spiritual realm, we we don't live spiritually in a democracy. We live in a theocracy, right? We live in a kingdom. There's a king, right? We live in a kingdom, and the king sets the rules in the kingdom. And so how does the world look at identity? How does the kingdom look at identity? Let's start out talking about the world. The world views identity as who we are based on group affiliation and shared experience. If you're taking notes today, I'm going to throw a lot at you. I had a bunch of people tell me after first service, "Woo!" I was trying to keep up. (laughs) So I'm going to try to repeat some stuff to help you all today. Because I'm going to cover a bunch of stuff today. So I'm going to try to repeat some of this. So the world views identity as who we are based on group affiliation and shared experience. There's an assumption about your identity based on the group you're in. People are going to assume that Morgan, because she's a female, has certain shared experiences as nature of being a female. People are going to assume because the color of your skin or the country of your birth that you've had certain experiences, whether you have or not, right? People are gonna assume you've had those same experiences. And so the world views our identity as based on our group affiliation. What group are we affiliated with and what does that mean about our assumed shared experience? Now I'm gonna talk about three things for both views today. I'm gonna talk about the focus, the fuel, 
in the finish line. If you want to write those down, I'm going to talk about the focus. What is it focused on? I'm going to talk about the fuel. What's driving this worldly identity? And I'm going to talk about the finish line. Where does it end up? Where does it take us? Because all the theology is great, but we need to understand the reality of what's about to happen. Of what is the fruit of worldly identity or kingdom identity. So let's start out, let's talk about the focus. The focus. Fleshly identity is obsessed with how others view me and treat me based on my group affiliation. Fleshly identity is obsessed with how others view me and treat me based on my group affiliation. Now, how does this manifest? We're going to talk about a few different areas today. Number one is sexuality. How many of you know sexuality being pushed really big today as a part of our identity? It's everywhere. It's everywhere we turn. They're trying to sexualize almost everything in our culture. Now, probably a year, year and a half ago, uh, Pastor Troy, our senior pastor, he put out a post on Instagram. He, this, this post was about Harry Styles. Now, how many of you have seen this post? Okay, eh, maybe 20% of you. So I think in the back, I think they have the post. They're going to put it up on the screen for you so you can, you can look at it. But he put this post up about Harry Styles. It shut the whole thing down. Um, even the computers were like, no! Um, so Harry's in a dress. Harry, Harry Styles, this was for a magazine cover, okay? So Harry does this magazine cover wearing a dress. Pastor Troy posted this. Sorry, Harry, I'm a man. Hashtag, put your pants back on, men. Now, some of you laugh. Um, I got a kick out of it. Um, a lot of Christians got really angry with Pastor Troy because of this post. Now, I know that because when people are angry, I'm the person they call. <laughs> That's kind of my role at the church. So when something's broken, when somebody's angry, when people are frustrated, it's like, call Olin. And so I'm getting the phone calls, and there were a number of Christians, believers, sometimes even leaders, who were concerned or frustrated or angry or whatever about this post. Now, in having some of those conversations, something that kind of stuck out or stood out to my mind is that at the same time, or maybe a little bit before that, I had read an article. There was this guy who created a website, and I believe the name of it was Ashley Madison. I think was the name of the website. I think it was Ashley Madison. I always want to say Dolly Madison for some reason, but I think it was Ashley Madison. This website was a website you go and pay a fee and they will anonymously get your information and you're a married person, they will pair you up with another married person for you to have an affair. Now, I learned about it because some, some very famous politicians and even, I think, one famous pastor, they had a leak, like somebody hacked their system and it went public and they got embarrassed because they were on the site, Okay. So I read this article about it, and in reading it, what I learned was this guy who started this website was going out speaking, writing articles, doing stuff, proclaiming to the world that adultery is good. That if you're married, every married couple should have an affair. Affairs are great. Affairs are going to give you this freedom. It's really good for your marriage. Every married couple, every spouse should have an affair. Now, in hearing that, if Pastor Troy would have made an Instagram post about that guy, about his website, and said, sorry, whatever his name was, I'm faithful to my wife, hashtag men keep your pants on. on. Something like that. Not one Christian would have gotten upset. I wouldn't have gotten one phone call, not one email, because we view adultery as a sin we commit. But somewhere, somehow, as believers, we've allowed the world to brainwash us that issues of sexual whatever is a part of our identity. Let me tell you, Harry Styles wasn't born wearing a dress. He chose to put a dress on. It was a behavior. It was an action, just like adultery. And so who was Harry Styles talking to when he did this, when he was trying to to push this, this idea of sexual identity. He wasn't talking to me. Number one, I ain't wearing a dress. 
be the ugliest woman ever. Like, ooh, can you? I know. People right now are like, ooh, God. Be terrible, right? Like, yeah, I can't. My eyes. Not going to happen. He's not talking to me. He's talking to our kids. Because it's kids who are listening to pop music. And so this, this artist, this star, is doing this article, putting this magazine out, out here. Why? Because he wants to send a message to our children that men dressing like women is normative behavior. And thank God we have a pastor who is willing to stand up publicly and say, no, it's not. It's not. It's not normative. I never get on Instagram. I got in some of the comments and people were like, yeah, but they wear kilts over in Ireland or Scotland. And I'm like, we ain't in Scotland. I mean, we don't wear kilts. We don't wear dresses. It, the, the, the signal was clear. He was sending this message to our kids. What about ethnicity? Race and ethnicity have been a pretty hot topic the last year and a half, right? Two years. Race, when we talk about race and ethnicity, those terms, race is typically seen as biological, ethnicity more as cultural. Did you know that there's statistically zero biological difference between races? In a recent Healthline article, and I quote, it wrote that decades of research has shown the lack of genetic difference between racial and ethnic groups. The idea of quote unquote race doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny. See, the reality is that there is only one race. There aren't any races. When we, when we accept the premise that there's this racial war, number one, there's one race. Now, we have different ethnicities, thank God. I love the diversity and the, and the flavor that adds to life. It's, a, it's incredible. But I know there's only one race because when people of different ethnicities get married to each other, they can have kids. If we were different races, we couldn't procreate. That tells you right there, this whole race thing is being driven by the enemy. Why does race even have significance today? Because Satan loves to take what God gives us as this beautiful gift of diversity and, and ethnicity, and he likes to turn it into racism and hatred. He likes to drive our identity based on that. What about gender? The worldly view, what I would say the satanic view, turns everything into a struggle for power. Because that's how Satan views everything. Satan couldn't be okay to be number two in heaven, right? He couldn't be all right to worship God. He had to say, why am I not God? Why is God suppressing me? Why am I not number one? And so Satan views everything as this struggle for power, and that's what he's turned gender relations in our country to. Everything's got to be a struggle for power. Men are oppressing women. Women have to rise up. And that's not from God. God didn't create different genders for us to fight against each other. And we've become so desperate to prove men and women are identical, we've become fools. The Bible says, in having become wise, they will become fools. We have biological men in the MMA beating up women. It is the craziest, silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's insane. But that's where our culture has gone. I saw a video the other day of a man trying to breastfeed a baby. Yeah. And he was shocked that it wasn't working. I got to be honest, that one tries the grace right there. <laughs> I'm like, woo. It's crazy. In the kingdom, differences can be celebrated. In the world, differences have to be eliminated. God created his kingdom to celebrate differences. And just because men and women are different doesn't mean one has more value than the other. God created us to complement each other, to help each other. What about politics? Good grief. Healthy political differences have become dangerous tribalism. Political differences should be how differences, not what and why differences. I remember growing up when Politics were feisty, but there was still a lot of, hey, we want the same things. We want clean streets. We want safe, you know, communities. We want good schools for our kids. We want prosperity for our nation. It's just an argument about how we're going to get there. Now, it's, no, we want to teach seven-year-olds about sexual content. 
So now politics is not turned into a question of how we get to a mutually agreed goal that's really good. No, now we got to worry about what are we even doing? Where are we going? It's become so tribal. And Satan wants to use politics to stir up hatred and division. Think about how often we find our identity in our political party. Well, I'm a Republican. Well, I'm a Democrat. You know, all that's fine. But listen, at the end of the day, I got to put my identity in Christ above that. I can't let my identity be found solely or primarily in my politics. It's got to be in Jesus. What about socioeconomics, class? Class is still a very real issue in the world and sadly even inside the church. Many times people in this room right now feel judged by others because of how much money you have or don't have in your bank account. We do it as Christians all the time. And we need to repent if we're classifying people based on how much money they have or how much money they make. We know the world does that. James chapter 2, it says how we treat someone when they come into the house of God. I don't have time to read it today, but you can go read it. James chapter 2, he talks about in the church, in your life group, when you have somebody rich come in and find clothes, don't sit them up front and say, oh, right this way, sir, and then take people who don't and stick them in the back or exclude them. That's wrong. That's favoritism. That's not Jesus. And so these are the focuses of worldly identity. It wants to put us in this, these groups, rich, poor, black, white, male, female, Republican, Democrat, and then pit us against each other because those group dynamics have to be so primary and important. So what's fueling this? That's the focus. What's the fuel? The fuel, Satan, we just read in that scripture that Satan energizes the sinner through resentment, anger, and bitterness. You can look in Galatians chapter five if you wanna read more about this and how this plays out. There's a contrast between the flesh and the spirit. And so Satan energizes. Sinful desires are insatiable. Fulfilling them just creates a craving for more. When you sin, it's never enough. It never satisfies you. There's always, it just creates a desire in you that you need to sin more, you need to sin worse. And so it's insatiable, this desire. The Greek word here is energeo. If you looked at it on a piece of paper, it looks almost like energy. It's where we get our word energy. And what it means is that we're putting someone's capabilities into operation. What that's telling you is Satan is not creating the issues. We have lust and desires inside of us. What Satan does is he puts gas on the fire. Satan tries to be the puppet master and pull at those strings that are already there in our heart. And so we all have these sinful desires, these lusts inside of us, and Satan brings the sinful capacity to us to life. He stokes the fires of jealousy, envy, and hatred. How do we see this playing out in our society right now? What's the evidence for this? Well, think about race, this insatiable thing. No matter how much racial progress we make as a nation, every few years, doesn't it feel like we take like 10 steps back? It's like things will feel pretty good. It's like, well, we've done some things. We're making progress. And then all of a sudden, it feels like, man, it's worse than it's ever been before. You're going to tell me there's more racism now than there were in the 1940s? That's ridiculous. That's insanity. But it doesn't matter how much progress we make, Satan wants to stir it up. He wants to create these racial tensions and make it worse. Do you think that's fueled by God or, or the devil? What about gender? A desire to eliminate any difference has led us into a genderless chaos that is literally destroying our young people. You can see this today in the statistics because there's been a dramatic spike in suicide rates, in gender dysphoria, transgenderism, things like that in our young people. Now, where did that come from? Is that just in the water? Did we just wake up one day and biologically this just became a three times bigger issue? No, it's because that's what's being pushed in our culture. It's because that's what Satan is pushing our way as our identity. What about sexuality? Sadly to say, sexual purity is no longer even a goal. It's so sad. Even in the church, guys, we've waved the, the white flag of surrender. We don't even set that as a goal anymore. I mean, we just assume people that aren't married or just having sex, casual sex. We've just, we just kind of turn a blind eye to it. We make jokes about it not being right, but we don't confront it. We joke about it because we've given up. 
That's the truth. In the church, we've, we've, we've given up. Parents and society as a whole just, just assume that it's happening. And let me just tell you, this today's not a, a message on sexuality or on sex, but let me just tell you, if you read the scripture, you even just quickly, sex can't be casual. It can't be casual. Our society has turned sex and sexuality into something that's casual. That is totally anti-God. Sex is something that is important. It is something that is holy. It is something that is beautiful, but it is not casual. It cannot be casual. And so I want to confront a problem before we move to the finish line today. Something that I think is one of the biggest problems in the church and in how we view these types of issues. The problem brought to me many times is that the church focuses too much on certain sins. And so we're fighting against certain things in our society. Right now, our pastor is really taking a stand on, on social media. We're talking about the LGBTQA-7497. Every day there's a new decimal point. I don't know anymore. But that community and that fight. And so it's like, why do we focus on that and we don't focus on this? Why is there so much a focus on sexual sin, but not a focus on this other type of sin. And let me just say, first and foremost, is that a problem? Yes. Yes. Do we do that as a church? Yes, we do. But guess what? So do you. I do it. You do it. We all do it. We all have certain sins that push our buttons worse than others, right? For me, it's stealing. When I see a video of somebody still in a car or something like that. I don't know what it is. It makes me so mad. I about drop kick my iPad through the wall. I'm like, my dad just comes up out of me. I'm like, get him! I mean, just, I'm, thinking, I'm like Clint Eastwood. I'm like, hang him high. You know, I'm just like, no mercy at all, man. Something about stealing just gets me going. I am mad. For some of you, maybe it's uh, abuse things because maybe you went through that. Maybe you were a victim of that or you knew people that were victims of that. But we all have our pet sins. We all have sins that we think are worse than others or make us more angry than others. We all do that. The church does that. We're human beings. But I would love to submit to you today humbly that that is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is not that we're over-focusing on certain sins. The problem is that all of us are not focusing enough on the problem of sin. Now imagine for a moment, I took a handful of us in here today, and I dumped us into a pit of venomous, deadly snakes. How many people do I have in here that do not like snakes? A little afraid of snakes. Yeah. Up here, I mean, the hands just shot up. You're with me. No snakes, please. So we get dropped, we're, we're dropped into this pit of snakes, right? And there's four or five of us, whatever. We're surrounded by venomous snakes that can kill us. All of them can kill us. Now, if one of the person in the group starts going, hey, 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 that's a cobra. That's a cobra. That one's a cobra. It's a cobra. Now, that person might be really focused on the one snake. Is that our biggest problem? No. The problem it's the snakes. We're in a pit of deadly snakes. That's the biggest problem. Not which one I choose to focus on. The problem is that any of them can bite me and kill me. And too often as Christians, we've allowed the world to shape our view of sin so that we view sin as a toy God won't let me play with instead of a deadly snake he's trying to deliver me from. Sin is not your friend. Sin is not fun. Sin is not this cool thing. I want you to think about this for a minute. What's the worst moment of your life? Maybe it's when your mom died. Maybe it was when you had an accident or somebody betrayed you. But think of that moment in your life. We all have one, probably many of them, where you ever just remember being broken? Where you're crying, and I mean the messy crying, like the snots everywhere, like you don't even care anymore. You're just, <laughs> you can't breathe, you can't talk. You're bawling your eyes out. Your heart is broken. Your life is over. I mean, you, it's the worst moment of your life, the worst pain you have ever been through. Can you, can you feel it? Do you remember that moment? Sin did that to you. That was sin. Remember a person you love that died? Your grandmother, your mom, your sister, your brother. 
broke your heart. Sin killed him. That was sin. Not only did sin kill him, sin killed him. Sin watched you weep and sin laughed. Sin is not your friend. Sin is our enemy. Sin hates us. Satan uses sin to steal, kill, and destroy. And we have to stop looking at sin as some toy that, oh, God just won't let me play with that fun thing. No, because the Bible tells us that God created a paradise. He put us in it, and then because of our sin, we wrecked it. And through sin, the Bible says, enter death, disease, lack, poverty, loneliness, rape, murder, everything bad you can think of came in because of sin. So sin's not a plaything. Sin's not a toy. No, sin is deadly and we have to view it that way. And we have to understand as Christians that God has given us the power to fight against sin and to overcome it and to help other people. So what's the finish line? Where does this worldly identity take us, this sinful agenda of the enemy? The finish line is the thief. We just said it comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy people by turning identity into idolatry. He wants to turn your identity into idolatry. And you know the problem with idolatry? Number one, it's the most offensive thing possible to the God who loved us, created us, and gives us breath and life. It's so offensive to God. Idolatry is terrible. But the other thing that's so bad about idolatry is that it's worshiping a dead God who's powerless to help you. When we turn to idols and turn away from God, we rob ourselves of a relationship with a real, loving, powerful God who loves us. The whole point is to make sure people don't turn to Jesus and worship God. That's Satan's agenda. When we put our earthly identity before our spiritual identity, that is idolatry. I am a child of God before I'm an American, before I'm a husband, before I'm a man, before I'm a white person, before I'm a Carter. And this one's tough for me to say, but even before I'm a Tar Heel fan. (laughs) It's tough because there are Duke fans and sometimes... You just want to, but I'm like, Christian first, Christian first, Christian first, Christian first. My spiritual identity has to come before all those other groups, all those other identities, all those other facets of who I am. And when I invest my life into my status here on earth, guess what? I've got to live in fear of losing it. My socioeconomic status, when that is where I invest my time, when that's where I invest my focus, guess what? That becomes an idol. And my socioeconomic status becoming my God, let me listen to me, it's a dead God with no power to save you. It can't keep you out of hell. It can't fill your heart with joy. It can't bring lasting satisfaction. It can't heal your body when you're sick. It can't restore marriages. No, it's a dead God. My group identity, no matter if that's racial identity, gender identity, sexual identity. Listen, that can't save you. Dead God, idol, my social standing with others. That becomes an idol. And so we have to identify where our identity is becoming idolatry. And we've got to turn to God. Now let's view identity from a spiritual or kingdom of God perspective. Because identity is not a bad thing. Identity is who we are. It's how we identify who we are. The kingdom views identity as who we are based on our relationship to God through Christ. We're going to talk about the focus. We're going to talk about the fuel, and we're going to talk about the finish line. Where does, where does this kingdom identity take us today? Well, what's the focus? Our kingdom identity is based on our relationship to the king. It is God-focused, not Man focus. Verse 6 tells us that he raised us up with him, with Christ, and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We have a secure position in the kingdom. When you come to Jesus Christ, you become spiritual royalty. You get to walk around with a different aspect, with a different perspective on life because you become a child of the king. 
You're no longer a pauper. You're no longer a nobody. No, you've got purpose. You've got identity. Why? Because you walk in the courts of the King of Kings. Because his purposes live through you. Because he uses you. He can use you in your daily life. And so when we walk with that identity, that becomes our focus. I remember years ago, I had a good friend of mine, and uh, he was one of the youth at my old church, and he had this job at Starbucks, and this is back when Starbucks was brand new. It was like liquid gold, right? And he would trade it. He worked up here at the mall. He would trade it with the movie theater, with the ice cream place, and they would give him anything he wanted. So sometimes he'd call me up. He's like, you want to go to the movies? I'm like, yeah, I want to go to the movies. That'd be great. And he, we would go in free. We would see all these screenings and stuff. It was awesome. And uh, one day he called me and he said, hey, man. He said, uh, you, you want to go see that trailer for that new movie? And I'm like, do I want to see a trailer? He said, yeah, come on up. We'll see the trailer. I'm not going to drive to the, just to see a trailer. He said, no, just trust me. Just come on. So I show up. He's like, you want some ice cream? I'm like, do I want ice cream? Look at me. Of course I want ice cream. <laughs> we go to Cold Stone. He's like, we, we jump in front of everybody. He's like, hey, it's my friend. Give, give me anything he wants. And I'm like, oh, I'll take da 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 Here you go. We walk to the movie theater. There's this new movie coming out. There's this long line of people. You ever been, you know, AMC back in the day where there was just like a line down the deal? And I'm like, well, what are we going to do? And he asked the guy, he's like, hey, which theater is, oh, it's that one. He goes, okay. And I'm like, what do we do? There's this long line. We just walked past everyone. I felt a little bad, but then I kind of didn't. I kind of liked it. And we kind of, we just walked past everyone. Everybody's looking at us like, who, who is that? You know, and we just walk in, sit down on the front row. Thing starts, we watch the trailer. And then we just got up with our ice cream and left. Like we just owned the place. And I remember thinking, man, I could get used to this. This is kind of fun. Listen, that's how you should walk around if you're a child of the king. You have special access and privilege because your dad owns the joint. Your father owns, wherever you're at, the, the ground you're standing on, guess what? My dad's the owner. I'm a child of the king. Isn't that good? We see that God did this based on his grace, not my performance. Thank God. Because if I had to earn it, I'd have to keep it. I'd have to defend it. I'd have to protect it. I don't. You can get mad at me, offended at me. That's terrible. I'll try to work it out with you. But at the end of the day, my identity is not based on how you view me. I didn't earn my position. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Why? Because of him. Because my dad's the king. Why do I get to do what I get to do? I don't know. He picked me. He chose me. He picked you. Whatever it is today, and you might be thinking, well, I don't know if I'm qualified. You are. God picks you. God planted in you everything you need to be who's you, he, who he has called you to be. Everything in you, the Holy Spirit just energizes and brings it to life. So what's the fuel? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit energizes the believer through love, joy, and peace. Just like those sinful things live in our sinful nature and Satan just kind of pulls them out of us, just puts gas on the fire. Same thing when you're a believer, love, joy, peace is already in you. So the Holy Spirit just pours gas on the fire. He brings the gifts of God out of you. That's who you are. Your identity is not tied up in your sexuality. Your identity is not how tall you are as a man, what kind of job you hold, your bank account. No, your identity is tied up in the fact that God Almighty has deposited love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, miracle-working power. He's deposited it in you. And then the Holy Spirit comes and energizes the gift of God within you. We talked about how our sinful lusts and desires are insatiable. Well, the kingdom of God is the exact opposite. When we obey God, we're fueled by the Holy Spirit and it generates the peace of God. You can live with the peace of God. And so it brings me to this. Why are we fighting this fight as a church? Why are we taking stands for, for truth? For what God's word says. Why are we taking a stand against sinful things in our culture? Because God created us as his masterpiece for what purpose? For good works. Well, what is good? God's original design. And can I just tell you today, it is so good. 
Just like we get this twisted view of sin, we get this twisted view of God and his goodness. We view it as this boring thing where, you know, we can't have any fun. It's no good. We're just fighting against everything. No, God's original design is good. Imagine with me for a moment a world with true sexual purity. Think about this for just a moment. What would that world look like? It would be a world with no sex trafficking. None. No sex trafficking. Never again would a 12-year-old girl be kidnapped, thrown in a van. As a father, I can't even, I can't even think about it. That would never happen again. There would be no sexual abuse. In the kingdom of God, if we stepped into our identities, we put a lot of therapists out of work. If there was true sexual purity, there'd be no rape. There'd be no adultery. There'd be no pornography. There would be happy, lasting, passionate marriages that demonstrate God's love to our children. We'd have married couples that couldn't keep their hands off of each other. See what that's like. Come to my house. I'm telling you. I, I try to run, but she's fast. She's fast. She's after me. After me. I'm telling you. But that's the world, that's the world we would live in. All the divorce we see, it'd be gone. You'd see married couples in marital bliss, happy, passionate. Isn't that a great world? Can you envision that? No rape, no sex trafficking, no, none of this abuse. It would be gone and we would live in a world filled with love. Sexual purity would be amazing. Now before we get to the finish line, I've got to hit this. There's a difference between a refugee of sin and an apostle of sin. Now, what does that mean? It means we're going to have people come into our church that are refugees of sin, as we all were, okay? So we have a homosexual couple come into our church, sit right here. What are we going to do? We're going to love them. We're going to love them. We're going to love them like they've never been loved before. We're going to respect them. We're going to talk to them. We're going to hear their story. We're going to invest in them. We're going to welcome them into, into this community. And we're going to walk with them, hopefully, towards Jesus Christ. Right? But there's a difference between a refugee of sin and an apostle of sin. An apostle of sin is someone who comes in here and says, no, 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 I don't want to be free from sin. Sin is good, and it's good for our kids. And so imagine for a minute that someone came in that back door right now, came running up here, holding the snake. Remember the snakes we talked about? They got a, they got a cobra. And they run up front. As a shepherd, should I let them take the snake to everybody? What if they say, hey, I've got a great idea. I'm gonna take the snake and I'm gonna go, it's really cool looking, right? I'm gonna take it down to the kid's wing and let all the kids play with the snake. No, a good shepherd is gonna say, stop. That is a snake, it's deadly. Do not take it near our kids. Because that's the job of the shepherd. And thank God we have good shepherds at Freedom House Church that can recognize a snake. Don't forget that God started with the law. He didn't send Jesus first. No, he sent the law because if a man doesn't know he's a sinner, he doesn't need a savior. And so sometimes we have to call out sin, speak God's law in grace, in love. Why? To call people to repentance, to call people to the love of God so they can experience Christ. So what's the finish line? The finish line of identity in the kingdom is we glorify God best by being thankful for who he is and what he has given us. Our identity as believers is not rooted in who we are, but in whose we are. We should be patriotic. Why? Because America is the best country in the world? No. No, that's not why we're patriotic. Because if I was born in Guatemala, should I be patriotic? If I was born in Argentina, should I be patriotic? If I was born in France, should I be patriotic? Yes, why? Because that's the country God gave me. This is the country God gave us. We should protect it. We should be thankful for it. That's what patriotism means. It's an expression of our stewardship for what God has blessed us with. We should champion men and women. Masculinity is not toxic. And femininity is not weak. We need to be thankful for the genders God created us in and celebrate how our differences make us stronger together. We should not give up on sexual purity. 
I want to call us today as a church, let's not give up on sexual purity. There's not a person in here today. Sometimes we feel we don't want to confront sexual sin because we've all probably had some. And we think, well, I'm nobody to say anything back in college. And, I, you know, I messed up and I did this. And so we don't want to call out sin because we feel like, well, I'm guilty too. But listen, if you were bitten by a snake and somebody comes walking along, it's not hypocritical for you to say, whoa, don't go in there. I just got bit by a snake. Is that hypocritical? No. It's not hypocritical at all. And we've all been bitten by that snake. And although all sin makes us equally guilty before God, the Bible makes it very clear that sexual sin is a special kind of snake. It's a special kind of snake because we sin against our own body and we defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's not give up on sexual purity as Christians. We should be racially reconciled. We don't need to accomplish this, guys. We don't need to work for that. It's not something we accomplish. It's something we live in because Christ already accomplished it. I can't, I can't force you to love your white or black brothers and sisters, but the gospel, when Jesus Christ is in your heart, he empowers you to truly love people despite their ethnicity. That's the kingdom that we're called to. I wanna ask you to stand on your feet for just a moment. We're gonna pray today, but before we do that, I wanna ask you to, to bow your head and to close your eyes for a moment because I, wanna, I want you to think about who we should be, who you should be, our identity as Christians, as believers. And if you're not a believer today, we're gonna pray in a moment. You're gonna have an opportunity to put your faith in Jesus Christ. We just read this scripture that talks about how it's by his grace, not your works. It's not about how good you are. We don't go to heaven because we stop sinning. We go to heaven because Jesus paid for our sin. He paid for yours. He loves you so much. But I want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to focus for just a moment on the words I'm about to say. If you're online, just focus for just one more moment. This is so important. Who are we as a church? Who are we as people, as believers, as followers of Jesus? I believe we should be the most thankful, happy people in the world. I believe we should be a refuge for the struggling, a refuge without judgment. Why? Because we've all been bitten by the same snake. A place where men are encouraged and women are empowered. A place of true sexual purity. A place where marriages thrive. A place of racial reconciliation because we have all been reconciled with God through Jesus. We should be the church of Jesus Christ. We should have our identity bathed in grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from work so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. I wanna ask you today, if your identity has been in anything less than your sonship, than your connection with the King through Christ, if you see yourself as anything other than a son or daughter, if your job, your money, your race, your racial status, your, your, your gender, your sexuality, your whatever it is, your past, if anything else has been your identity more than who you are in Jesus, I want to ask you right now to repent from that. Repentance means turning away. I just want you to turn away from that identity and walk towards your identity in Christ. You are called to be royalty. You are called to be a son or daughter of God. So if that's you today and you say, yes, my identity has been way too wrapped up in all the stuff and all the fights and all the things and my opinion and who I am, my identity has been wrapped up, but I want to be set free. I want my identity to be found in God. If that's you today, I just want to just challenge you, act of faith right now. Will you just lift up your hand? If you want to repent from that, if you want to ask Jesus to be your identity today, would you just lift up your hand? If you're online, you can click a button in the chat. We have people that will pray with you, connect with you. But I'm going to ask everyone in the room, if you've never received Jesus, you can pray this prayer right now. We're going to ask Jesus into our heart if you've been a Christian for 20 years and maybe you just want to repent today from that identity. You want to step into your identity. Let's all pray this together. Say, Father God, I thank you that my identity is in you. I'm not going to worship an idol. 
It's not going to be about me, how much money I have, my race, my gender, my family, my past. I call on you to set me free. I step into my identity in you. You died for me. You rose again. And I receive that right now by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.